What's up everybody, Rob here. So, the 1500s were a period of major transition throughout Europe. Feudalism was breaking down, a new mercantile economic system was emerging, replacing the old guild-based economic system, and a German monk was starting a new religious movement that would soon spread throughout Europe, causing centuries of conflict. Nowhere in Europe were these changes as strongly felt as in the Holy Roman Empire. So this bubbling cauldron of political, social, and economic change would eventually spark the Knights Revolt, in which the upper classes would actually rebel against their new station in society. So yes, instead of being a peasant's revolt, this was actually a revolt of nobility, which is kind of odd in the grand historical scheme of things, but you know, hey, history has nothing if not a sense of irony. But in any case, without any further delay, here is a very brief look at the Knights Revolt, also known as the Poor Barons' Rebellion. Alright, so throughout the Middle Ages, the feudal system was the default form of government. It was a very decentralized system, it was also a very complex and multi-tiered system in which the local nobility held the power. Now maybe a king or an emperor or whomever was on top of this pyramid and on paper owned all the land and was in absolute control of everything, but, you know, for... All practical purposes, the local warlords were the ones who held sway. Now, with the breakdown of the feudal system, the power of a particular nation was becoming more and more centralized. In addition to this, economic systems were also shifting as well. The old guild-based systems were breaking down and being replaced by a more mercantile system, basically a proto-form of what we would today refer to as capitalism. So because of all this, the local warlords, basically the barons and you know, lower ranking knights and such, they had less and less power as more power was being either taken up by the king or whoever was in charge. You know, the power was becoming more centralized in their hands and also more wealth was going to the lower classes, basically merchants and tradesmen, stuff like that. Because of this new capitalist system, more wealth was being generated and it wasn't going into the nobles' hands. It was going into the central government's hands through taxes and you know, tariffs and that sort of thing, and also in the hands of these merchants who would become basically insanely wealthy. And it was these middle class, basically, I want to say middle, not middle class in our sense of middle class, but middle class in sense of a feudal system. You know, these barons that were kind of stuck in the middle, they were being forced out of their positions of wealth and power. On top of all this, the role of the knight, who basically was a mounted warrior on horseback, was being overtaken by infantry formations, particularly in the Holy Roman Empire, mercenaries, specifically the Lens Connect, and their dominance on the battlefield was also waning. So basically, pretty much from every direction, the power of the knight and the power of these, you know, the land and nobility was slowly being eroded. And just to rub some salt in the wound, in 1495, there was the Diet of Worms, or Worms. Four years of German people, this is the best you're getting out of me. Any case, um, at this particular diet, there was a ruling that forbade private warfare between knights amongst the Holy Roman Empire. Now, the Holy Roman Empire is, I'm just going to say complex. I mean, look at this. It's, it's a cartographer's nightmare trying to map this all out. Any case, all of these little independent fiefdoms and kingdoms and everything else. The Holy Roman Empire was not really a nation so much as a loose confederation of all of these different lands, and they were more often than not going to war with each other as much as they were going to war with an outside threat. So warfare at this time could actually be very profitable if you knew what you were doing and you were skillful enough. If you go to war with your neighbors, that's plunder, that's wealth in for a form of land and you know goods, stuff like that. And also could be in the form of ransoms. You take a knight or a nobleman hostage, you can then ransom back to his family and they'll pay you for it. And so if you knew what you were doing, yeah, you can make a ton of money this way. And so with the the ban on private warfare, it basically removed yet another income source from the various knights and the lower class nobility. And just because things aren't complicated enough, let's throw some religion into the mix. In 1517, a German monk by the name of Martin Luther decided that it would be a good idea to openly complain about the church, and suffice it to say, things got pretty complicated. So I'm not going to go into any further here, this is not about the Reformation, it's about the Knights Revolt, but just want to give you some full background here. So in addition to the social and economic issues that were going on, there was also this religious issue as well, and... Um, yeah, just keep that in mind. So basically, the Holy Roman Empire, basically what is now Germany, was in a state of massive, massive upheaval in pretty much every way possible. Into this chaotic mix came two very prominent individuals, Franz von Sickingen and Ulrich von Hutten. Sickingen was a knight that had decades of combat experience and oftentimes portrayed himself as a liberator of the oppressed. 
In 1518, for example, he used his forces to intervene on behalf of the citizens of Metz and their fight against the oligarchs of the city, leading 20,000 men against the city until the oligarchs gave in to his demands. He did this all while risking an imperial ban for his action. He also used his power and influence to help secure the election of Charles V Habsburg as the Holy Roman Emperor. At about this time, Martin Luther was also preaching his reforms for the church, and Sigigen was able to harbor Luther, protecting him from the fate that awaited heretics like Jan Hus, about a century earlier, who was burned at the stake. So overall, Sigigen always tried to portray himself as the defender of the oppressed, the uplifter of the weak, you know, that sort of thing, protector of the innocent, you know, that kind of image. Now, maybe he did actually care for the people he saw as oppressed, uh, but he certainly did profit from it, becoming very wealthy along the way. In addition to Luther, he also harbored other humanists and reformers, including Ulrich von Hutten. Hutten was the eldest son of a poor knightly family, and he was also very small and sickly as a child, and he was sent to a Benedictine monastery to become a monk. There he gained an education, since monasteries throughout the Middle Ages were the main centers of learning, but he chafed under the very strict discipline of the monastic lifestyle and soon left the monastery. He then traveled to Cologne, where he became involved with a group of poets and scholars, where he developed a more humanistic philosophy. He also became a satirist, and his works were highly critical of the ruling class and the clergy. Also on top of this, he was a bitter opponent of the Pope after his experiences in Italy. Yes, he was pretty well-traveled. And uh, so when the Reformation came about, he jumped onto the movement with both feet. In 1522, Sigigen and Hutton, as well as a few others, hatched plans to overthrow the established social order. They called themselves the Brotherly Convention of Knights, who duly elected Sigigen as their leader, as he had a tremendous amount of military experience, and they were going to need it. They were spurred on by secularization and humanist ideals, as opposed to the old traditional religious ideals, as well as a very strong burgeoning sense of German nationalism. They called for all German-speaking lands to be united under a single ruler, which would be elected by a nobleman's democracy. Church holdings would also be seized, and lands that were ruled by church officials, which were prince bishoprics, would be secularized. Many of the lands in the very chaotic mix that was the Holy Roman Empire were under the direct control of the church, and they were ruled over by what was known as a prince bishop. So these lands would be taken from the church and turned over to secular rulers, again following this very humanist and secular new way of thinking. So in 1522, they had their opportunity. Charles V was out of Germany and in Spain, and it was a perfect time for them to strike. After gathering their forces together, they struck at the electorate of Trier, one of the most powerful and important portions of the Holy Roman Empire. Though the city was their target, their actual specific objective was the elimination of Richard Briefenklau. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce it, I think. Again, four years of German, that's the best you're going to get from me. In any case, he was the Archbishop of Trier, and the situation between them was a bit personal. The Archbishop was one of the driving forces of the Diet of Worms, and the law that made private warfare illegal and put many other restrictions on the knightly class, basically, they originated from him. So this was a little bit of payback on the part of Sikigin and Hun. So with a degree of vengeance in mind, they set out and marched on the city. And while they were marching on the city, they went all in with the religious propaganda, which is a bit hypocritical given that secularization and humanism was one of the main tenets of their ideology, but you know, hey, never pass up a good propaganda opportunity. So at this point, Luther's teachings were used, linking the Archbishop of Trier with the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church. They used Luther's name and his movement in order to help gain support for their particular cause. He had hoped that the peasants would rise up and overthrow the city's government on their own, and in doing so would help avoid the prolonged nature of a very protracted siege, which was something that Sikigin wanted to avoid. In addition to the religious propaganda, he also had his troops fly the imperial banner, hoping to add a degree of legitimacy to his cause, and basically show the people of Trier that, look, we're helping liberate you from the oppression of illegitimate governance. You know, like they were trying to take on the mantle of legitimacy and all this, and hopefully that would help out their cause. Well, did it work? Of course not. First off, although he was a member of the clergy, the Archbishop of Trier, Richard Griefenklau, Griefenklau, whatever, he was hardly a pushover and he was able to secure Trier against Sikigin's forces. The peasants also failed to rise up in revolt and Sikigin, Hutton, and the others were forced to dig in for a siege, the very such thing that Sikigin wanted to avoid. They launched five separate assaults during the course of the siege, all of which were repulsed. 
In addition to this, the other local nobles, seeing what was going on, were gathering their forces, and soon a relief column was on their way to help relieve the siege. Basically, they didn't want the intellectual contagion that was Sikigin's and Hutton's ideology. They didn't want it spreading to their lands and revolt in one land, oftentimes these things spread to others, so they wanted this thing shut down pretty quickly. And so they did. So the Grand Secular Revolution inside of Trier failed to materialize. There were multiple columns of enemy combatants coming to relieve the siege. The city walls were pretty much untouched. I mean, they were virtually undamaged throughout the entirety of the siege. And just on top of all of this, they failed to take into consideration proper logistics, which is a key to running any successful military campaign. And after less than a week, they ran out of gunpowder, forcing the Grand Revolution of Sikigin and Hutton to basically collapse under its own weight. Pretty anticlimactic, if you ask me. So, when everything just kind of fell apart around them, Hutton fled the country, traveling to Switzerland. He would eventually die there in a monastery from the effects of syphilis because, you know, of course he did. Sick again, however, was made of sterner stuff and decided to fight it all out and withdrew to Landstuhl and its castle there. He hoped to be able to withstand the forces that were closing in on him, relying on the castle's high and solidly built walls. Now, generally speaking, this would be a pretty good idea. I mean, castles are designed to withstand, you know, sieges, and they're designed to keep people out. They do that job very well. However, he made a huge miscalculation. He grossly miscalculated the destructive power of artillery, which was becoming more and more prominent at this time. And soon, the fortification's thick walls were being blasted apart with huge breaches being torn into them. On May 6th, 1523, Sikigin was severely wounded and was forced to surrender the castle. He died a few hours later. So, with Sikigin's death, the very short-lived rebellion collapsed. It started in August of 1522, and by May of 1523, it had pretty much fallen apart. Knights and lower-level nobility continued to lose their prestige and wealth throughout the Holy Roman Empire and Europe at large. The transient forces that were arrayed against them simply did not have a place for their type any longer. Now, Martin Luther was completely uninvolved in this. He really didn't have any direct participation in this, although the knights used his rhetoric as part of the reasoning for their revolt. And Martin Luther handled this in probably the worst way possible. He said nothing. And that actually further implicated him and actually gave a lot of people suspicion that he was somehow involved in this, and although there's no evidence to suggest that he was involved, the fact that he failed to condemn uh, Sick Again and Hutton pretty much laid even more suspicion at his feet, and that certainly complicated things a lot further for him. So Martin Luther's position at this time was precarious to say the least, and the last thing he wanted to do was be seen as fomenting any sort of violent rebellion. So why didn't he you know, condemn the the actions of Sick Again and Hutton and the others? Well, the very short answer, I think, basically comes down to he just didn't want to talk badly about his benefactors. These people had sheltered him and given him a position of security while he was going about his business, and therefore he just simply did not want to do anything that, you know, well, he just didn't want to condemn basically people that had helped him out when in, in their time of need. However, I uh, According to all evidence, he had nothing to do with this revolt and probably would have been against it. Again, though, he absolutely said nothing about it directly. So what was the end result of the Knights' Rebellion? Well, it was a dismal failure. That's pretty much obvious. The, the Rebellion failed to achieve any real significant objectives directly. They really did not do that much. They actually, if anything, weakened the power of Knights and Barons within the Holy Roman Empire and actually accelerated processes that they were trying to stop. So actually, they had the reverse effect, ultimately making things much worse for their cause. The leaders of the revolt were both dead. Martin Luther had a lot of suspicious eyes pointed in his direction, and the prestige of knighthood continued to collapse. So, yeah, the whole thing was a very dismal failure from beginning to end. However, ideas are very hard to kill, and eventually the Knights' Revolt would inspire the German Peasants' Revolt, which would be much more devastating and have much more long-reaching consequences, but that's a story for another day. So this is just a very brief look at the Knights' Rebellion, or the Poor Barons' Rebellion. I just thought it was interesting. Uh, there's not really a tremendous amount to talk about with it. It was a very short-lived thing that, you know, I mean, stuff happened, but it's not like, you know, earth-changing, earth-shattering stuff here. Uh, I just found it really odd because basically you have a bunch of the nobles that are rebelling. I mean, we hear about peasant rebellions all the time, but you almost never hear about the knights rebelling against the social order. So I just thought that was pretty interesting, and I figured I'd give a brief look at it. In any case, uh, that's pretty much it for the video. Please hit the like and subscribe button. More videos coming out whenever I get around to it, and have a good day. Or don't have a good day. You're adults. Have any kind of day you want. See you later.